Hi, I'm Jonah, and this is a Learn to Play tutorial for Colors of the Wind. Now this is an arrangement by Bob Child, and, and what that means is that he took the original score and he, he arranged it so that it fits the flute. And he did a really good job with it. I really enjoy this, this version of it. And I found this on flutopedia.com, which is an amazing website. It's so full of information. I highly recommend taking a look at it. And I want to give a lot of gratitude to them for offering this song and many others for free to the public. Now, I think of this as an intermediate level song because it moves along kind of quickly. It's got some notes over the octave, which means, means that there's some large cross fingerings, and there's a little bit of offbeat rhythms in it. That said, if, you com if you're comfortable with the pentatonic scale, you've been playing the flute for a little bit, but, and you haven't really pushed your limits beyond the pentatonic scale, that scale that we all learn when we first learn to play, then I think this song, that I think this song is doable. I think it'll push you into some new areas that you can also use in your everyday playing to really you know, uh, spice up your, your everyday improvisations. Now I'm going to be playing this on a flute in the key of A, but like most of these tutorials, you can play this on almost any key. When you start getting into the bass tone flutes, the deeper flutes, the notes over the octave don't play in, as true, meaning they're not always in tune. And so if you're playing with other instruments, it, it might clash and it might not sound that great. If you're playing on your own, it might sound fine. If you like it, then go for it, and, and that's all that really matters. So I'm going to play through the song once, then go through a little introduction of how to use this tutorial, and then move right into the tutorial itself. Now the easiest way that I find to learn songs is to work through them phrase by phrase. Now phrases are like sentences. You put a bunch of sentences together to build a story. In the same way, you put a bunch of phrases together to build a song. Essentially, each time you pause to take a breath, you've completed a phrase. And because in the music we've added these breath marks, you can easily see that the phrases begin and end at each of these breath marks. I've also noted the number of the phrases using these italicized numbers. Phrase one, two, and so on. As I walk through each phrase, I'll note anything that's unusual or particularly challenging in that phrase. And then I'll show you how to play it. And I'll play it at a really slow tempo. And at that point, I suggest pausing the video and working on that phrase until you have the fingerings and the rhythm pretty well down at that slow tempo. And then move on to the next phrase. Once you move through the whole song, I suggest going back to the beginning of the song and working through each phrase again. And each time you do that, your hands will memorize the fingerings a little bit more and you'll memorize the rhythms a little bit more and the song will get easier to play and you can start bringing it up to tempo. These are the notes that some of you may not have played before, so when you come to these notes in the song, have some patience with yourself. It may take a little time to learn the transitions from the note before it to this note and to the note after it. I'll also talk more about these transitions and notes as we come upon them in each phrase. So this is the sheet music for Colors of the Wind, and this version has the tablature numbers in it, these numbers here. But for my eye, they can be kind of 
overwhelming to ha have these numbers in here. It makes it very full to look at. So on the web page for this song, I have two different versions of the tablature for download, one that has the tablature numbers and one without it. And before I move into the tutorial itself, I wanted to go over breath marks and how I place them into the music in these Learn to Play tutorials, because they're also what determines the phrases. And I'm putting them in there according to where I naturally want to take a breath and also what sounds correct to me or what sounds natural to me as far as phrasing goes in the song itself. So this is a good example of, of that because there's a couple spots here where I would naturally tend to put a breath mark, but after playing the music enough times found that it sounded better to me without them. The phrases sounded more fluid without them. So between phrases one and two, there's, a, there's this half note. And so often I'm looking for half notes or whole notes or a rest mark to, for taking a breath. It's a, usually a natural place in the music and in the phrases that the composer created to take a breath. So between phrases one and two, there's a half note there and it naturally feels like a good spot to take a breath and, and kind of separate out the phrases a little bit. So I put a breath mark there. However, in phrase three, these, there's a half note here. And originally where this little breath mark is, I had a breath mark and I separated it out into two phrases just because I visually saw there was a half note there and it seemed like a good spot to do it. But as I played the music more and more, I found that I felt the, the phrase flowed better it was more fluidity it went without taking a breath there. And so I took the breath mark out. That said, if you feel like you need to take a breath there, it's a good spot to do it. There's a half note, there's a natural pausing point there. I just wanted to show how I'm determining where to put breath marks. And sometimes it's according to where I need to take a breath because I just need air. But other times I might not put one there because I think the phrase and the music overall just sounds better and I can make it through that section on one breath of air. So this is the first phrase and it's a pretty straightforward phrase. A lot of the notes are moving in, in consecutive order in the, of the scale, the pentatonic scale that we all learn when we're first playing. So it, the technical finger movements tend to be relatively straightforward. What I found to be probably the most challenging in this phrase was just this string of eighth notes and how quickly it moves along through this and keeping track of where I am in the, in the phrase in order to shift back from the eighth notes to this quarter note and then the half note. This is phrase two, and phrases one and two are the theme of the song, and they are repeated later in the song with some variation, and I'll point that out. And like phrase one, it's technically pretty straightforward. You're moving a lot of consecutive notes. It's mostly just keeping track of where you are when you're moving through these, the string of eighth notes here. Phrase three is pretty long, and as I mentioned in the beginning part of the tutorial, originally I had broken this up into two different phrases where this little breath mark is here. But as I played through the song more, I found that it, this phrase flowed better. The two phrases that I originally had flowed better if I moved them into one phrase, if I didn't take a breath here and I just moved on through. And I found it was uh, relatively natural to do that in my breath in my breathing as well I didn't need to take an extraordinarily large breath of air in the beginning of the phrase in order to make it through so the beginning part before the little breath mark 
is again technically very similar and rhythmically very similar to phrases one and two. It's then the second part of the phrase where things shift up a little bit. So as you come off this half note, you move right into a couple eighth notes and then quarter note and then a string of eighth notes into a half note. So the rhythm changes here, so you'll want to keep track of that. Phrase four is exactly the same as phrase one. So we're back to the theme. So you've seen this phrase as phrase one already. And again, I think the most challenging part of the phrase is keeping track of where you are when you're running through this string of eighth notes. So phrase five is the second part of the theme, but unlike phrase four, where it's an exact replica of phrase one, the first part of the theme, phrase five has some variation compared to phrase two. And so, and it's very well crafted. The variation is, is very well put together here, and it really adds to the song. And the whole song is very, is beautifully put together in its themes and variations. You know, phrases one and two are the very clearly state the theme. Phrase three has the theme in it, but it's really has a lot of um, nuances and, and difference and really takes you on a different to a different place for a moment. And then we come to phrase four, which is very clearly states the beginning of the song again, very states that theme again. And then phrase five here, it's it's very similar to the, to the second part of the theme, but with the, enough variation on it that it really feels like it keeps the song moving forward. You're not just stating the beginning of the song again. You're, it creates this motion and we're moving forward in the theme as well. The theme is developing and, and evolving. Rhythmically, this phrase is a little different in that we have two quarter notes and then the string of eighth notes and then the half note, where in the others, it's just one quarter note to the string of eighth notes. So that's something to pay attention to. So this is phrase six, and it's very similar to phrase three. And the first thing I want to point out is, just like in phrase three, I originally had a breath mark here, but after playing through the song, I realized that it, to me, had more flow and sounded um, more true to the song to not take a breath at this point. Phrase six also happens to be very similar to phrase three. The first half before this little breath mark is the exact same as the beginning part of phrase three. But the second half is a little different, so you'll want to pay attention to that. So here we are at phrase seven, and this is kind of a crescendo in the song. Seven and eight are kind of a, 
kind of a high point in the song. We move into this realm where the song moves over the octave into these higher notes, and it has this kind of large feel to it compared to the rest of the song. It moves along kind of quickly, and it it just and it has these high notes built into it. And both seven and eight have that, and so it's kind of a crescendo in the song. It's also, I think, the most challenging part of the song, especially phrase seven, but both phrases seven and eight, I think this is the most challenging part of the song. And rhythmically, it moves along pretty quickly, the whole phrase. It's mostly eighth notes. And then you also, mixed in there, you have this dotted quarter note, which gets one and a half beats. And then you're changing notes on, because it gets one and a half beats, you're changing notes on the off beat to move into this note. So if you haven't worked with dotted quarter notes before, they can be a little tricky because you hold them for one and a half beats. So the best way that I find to learn these rhythms that use dotted quarter notes is to count them out. So let's do that now. So a measure of music is from this line to this line. And that's one measure of music, and each measure gets four beats. So if you're just counting the on beats, it sounds one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, if we add in the off beat, we add in the and, so we say one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and so you can hear the on beat is the clap and the number and the off beat is the and so if i was to count out this measure and clap my hands when you're changing notes, you would go one, two, three, and four, and one, and you would continue on. So if I was to count out this next measure, because it's all eighth notes, it's one, and two, and three, and four, and. So you're changing notes on the on beat and the off beat. So you're used to changing notes on the offbeat, all these strings of eighth notes throughout this whole song, you're doing that. What's different about this measure that we're going over is that you're holding this dotted quarter note for one and a half beats, and that creates a different rhythm than you may be used to playing. And I find clapping it out helps to create the feeling of the change because that, to me, is the easiest way to, over time, really learn how to see music where you're changing notes on the offbeat or just see a dotted quarter note and you know the feel of it in the music and how it's supposed to feel, the change is supposed to feel, and so it becomes less of a heady thing and more of a physical experience of playing music. So that said, if I count out the two measures together, starting here, I would go, One, two, three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, two, three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and. And then once you're comfortable with that, then playing it on the flute. And then once you're comfortable with that, you can start adding in the note changes. So maybe working on the note changes separately to get the dexterity of them, and then melding the two together at a slow tempo, and then bringing it up to tempo. So hopefully that gives you something to work with when you're learning these new kinds of rhythms. So rhythmically, this phrase has this variation in it, and it moves pretty quickly compared to the rest of the song. Now, Technically, fingering-wise, this is also 
uh, challenging in that we are going over the octave. So going from this note to this note, you're jumping over the octave. It's a pretty large cross fingering. And again, going from this note to this note, you're still, you're over the octave. So, and it's another large cross fingering. And then further down in this measure that we just talked about, while you also have this kind of unusual rhythm, there's also jumping over the octave going from this note to this note. And while it's not a cross fingering, you're not opening holes and closing holes, the note configuration that you're going to might not be one that your fingers are used to. So you'll have to develop a little muscle memory to do this transition. And then going from this note to this note to this note, these are large cross fingerings that we saw earlier in this phrase, but are also here. So you might need to take a little time to teach your fingers the dexterity of these transitions. Also, depending on your flute, it, you might need to use a, a more of a staccato tonguing or a, a harder tonguing, a real t t, you know, real kind of a forceful with a lot of pressure behind it. Not so much volume, but a lot of pressure uh, tonguing in order to pop the flute up into the higher notes and to jump it up into that higher register. In general, this phrase takes a lot of concentration to move through it correctly, even at a slow tempo. So if any of these things I've just gone over are new to you, I'd suggest first working on creating the muscle memory of these note changes of jumping over the octave and of these large cross fingerings and of the tonguing technique needed to jump the flute up into the higher register. And then once you kind of have that, once you're comfortable with those things, then start adding in the rhythm and playing through the whole phrase at a very slow tempo. And as you memorize the phrase more and more, you can start speeding it up till you're up to tempo. So a closer look at some of the cross fingerings in this. So I'm going to look down at the sheet music here and let's see, we're going from, we go from this note to this note. So here, then we go from here. So those are some pretty big cross fingerings, so go slow with them. Just start working on it. Uh, and just keep working on it like that. And that's how that's the most of the cross fingerings in the song are of that combination of some kind. So if you just can work through those enough to get the dexterity of it, it'll really help you move through the song without having to think about it too much, or you get the muscle memory and your fingers will just do it. That's easier said than done too. So give yourself some patience with that as well. So this is phrase eight. And like I said, it's one of the more challenging phrases in the song. It's not quite as long and technical as phrase seven, but it does have some of the same components. So in the beginning of the phrase is very much the same as the beginning of phrase seven where you're you're jumping up over the octave and there's some large cross fingerings here. So take some time to teach yourself the dexterity of these cross fingerings. And then rhythmically, this is a very fast phrase. It's all eighth notes. And then in most of the other phrases, we end with a half note, but in these we just end with two quarter notes and then we go to a, a quarter rest. So it keeps moving on pretty quickly compared to the other phrases. So you have to pay attention to that as you get to the end of this phrase and we move into phrase nine. Here we are 
in phrase nine, and we're, we're moving into the end of the song here, and it's moving downwards, and it's starting to pull us towards the end of the song. So we had seven and eight as this crescendo, and then eight starts to move us downwards, and then phrase nine really starts pulling down towards the end of the song, feeling-wise. So notationally, it's a pretty straightforward phrase. You know, we're not doing a ton of fingering changes. It's all consecutive notes. It's just, again, paying attention to where you are as you're moving through the eighth notes, and then holding this dotted half note for three beats. And phrase 10 is a really nice ending to the song, and I, I really enjoy how the whole song is put together, the whole structure of the song. From the very beginning, where you start moving upwards, and then it kind of takes a little dip, and then it really goes up in crescendos in phrases 7 and 8, and then, it, and then it brings you back down, and phrases 9 and 10 really work nicely together to bring you back down to an ending. And technically, phrase 10, like phrase 9, is pretty straightforward. And what I, I really like the way they work together, phrase 9 and 10, to create this feeling of finality. And phrase 9 is you're moving through, and you dip down, and you come back to the mid-range of the flute. And then phrase 10, you, you have that same movement as the beginning of phrase 9. So that repetition really feels good in having that pull down and, and having the notes, these three notes, one, two, three, you know, repeated in phrase 9 and phrase 10 really have this, this feeling of, of slowing down. And then in phrase 10, and you, you bring it dip down again, and then it comes up and it just ends right there. It just feels like real soft the way it ends.